All right, Josh Smith here, live at my Flat 5 Studios. Today my guest is a good friend, and no joke, one of the greatest guitar players I know, and the biggest influences, honestly, uh, on so many guys that maybe you haven't heard of him, and it's criminal if you have not, because this dude is a legend, and he has been on so many amazing records and played with so many people. If you've heard me talk about the people I respect, you've definitely heard me mention his name before. And actually, dude, your name comes up all the time when I'm interviewing other people. Guys bring you up all the time. And without blowing too much smoke up your ass, <laughs> let's just say this dude is, is, is the real deal. And I'm honored to call him a friend, and I'm just a huge fan, man. Jubu, thank you for being here. John Jubu Smith, come on. Hey, man, thank you for having me, and I'm honored to be your friend, bro. I'm, I, I, I said it again. I, I said it off camera. I'll say it again. You walked into Cozy's, man, and, you know, there, there are times where I, I have a mystique about me, especially if it's my gig or something like, you know, hey, man, I'm the baddest cat in the room or whatever, you know, I don't think that way no more. Cause I, I really, I really play for God. I really do, man. And when you, when you take, when you have that mindset, it, it takes a lot of that, that me thing away, but man, you came in and sat in with me and I said, wow, this dude will not back down. I'll, I'll throw some out there. You throw some out there. Said, Damn, that hurt. <laughs> you, know, I'll throw some out there. you throw some out there. I'll just say this, man. And I said it to Eric Gales before, there's there's a few people that I've run across that humble you. And you're one of those people. Wow. So I am I am grateful to be in, in your village, man. Well, man, right back at you, dude. I, in fact, I think that first time we met, I didn't even correlate that you were the Jubu that I'd heard on all those things. And who I, you know what I mean? You, it was like the first time seeing you in person, you know? So yeah. it was like, it took me a minute to kind of make the connection. I just thought, oh, this dude's a bad motherfucker. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and so, dude, let's let's just start at the beginning. I, I like to start, start all these interviews by knowing people's kind of uh, family history with music and how the guitar ended up in your hands. Now, I know you come from a musical family. Your brother plays, your family plays. You started in church, obviously. But who was the, the the first person that actually put the guitar in your hands? My father. Okay. My father, John T. Smith Sr. Um, rest in peace. He, um, I was like any any kid. Now, I, I my dad was my hero. So, yeah. had he been a boxer, man, that's what I I would be today. You know, had he been a basketball player, that's what I would have been trying to be. Mm -hmm. Luckily for me. He played the guitar, and my dad used to tell me that he was style over substance, and he wanted me to be substance over style, meaning that he learned a few licks, but he was able to par parlay that because he would he would say he would play a lick and then he'd say something to the audience, and you know that was that was kind of like his thing. But my father put the bass guitar because he had a gospel group called the Soulful Sons of Zion, mm -hmm. and the bass player quit. And my dad, my grandmother would tell me, like, every time my dad would put the guitar or the bass down, I'd run and grab it. My dad would take it from me. So around four years old, he would let me play around with the bass in my lap. And around six years old is when my grandmother told me that my dad told her I, can, I was following him. Like, wherever he... And this is quartet, so it wasn't, like, major changes, you know. Sure. One five four one four five, you know, bluesy type stuff. But I was able to follow him, you know. So, but I always I wanted to play guitar because, like I said, I wanted to be like my dad. And my dad would always get the oohs and ahs from the audience. <laughs> play John T. Play, play man, play boy. You know, for where with me it would be. Here's the little kid with the big giant bass. You know, and they would, I would get an accolade for a few minutes, but once my dad started performing, they forgot about me. You know what I mean? So I wanted to do what he was doing. So anyway, he, my dad went to work from four in the morning, five in the morning to 2.30. So my grandmother would always go into his closet and pull out the guitars and just let me mess around with the guitar because she knew that's what I wanted to play. So at nine years old, I broke up my dad's string. 
<laughs> so I couldn't I couldn't hide the truth anymore. Right. I couldn't hide it. The you know the fact that I've been messing with this guitar. So he gets home. My grandmother said, "Hey John, I got to tell you something. I let you play the guitar. He broke a string. He broke my string. I'm gonna whoop your ass. You know." Yeah. My grandmother said, John, he can play. He can play. He really can. You can play? I said, yes, dad, I can play. So he said, I'm going to put a string on here and you better be able to show me something. So he, my dad would always plug up his guitar amp. He had a big giant sun cabinet bass amp, <laughs> wow. right? <laughs> he would plug them both up in the little small living room in my grandmother's house in the projects, West Oakland. So this particular time, I'm scared as crap. My dad started playing bass, gospel song. So I, I started playing what, you know, I just saw him doing and everything. About five minutes later, he put the bass down. He said, man, you may be better than me. And that's when he finally let me just focus in on the guitar. Wow. But bass yeah. is my true root where I started from. Yeah. Man, and so for people who don't know a lot about the quartet scene and the gospel scene, uh, especially where you're from, is obviously like one of the biggest hotbeds for the history of that music. Um, so, I mean, I can't imagine, you must immediately start going and playing gigs with your dad, right? And and being around so many other guys your age who were having the same journey you were having right that minute, learning yeah. and getting into that scene. It's got to be inspiring to have other people your age kind of going through that same stuff you are. Well, it, it was, man. And and I wanted to say this, too. I'm from Oakland, California. I was born in New Jersey because my dad was in, in Vietnam. It's another story. My dad went to Vietnam once my mom got pregnant. She didn't want to be by herself. So she went to Jersey be with my grandparents. Okay. I was born. My dad gets out of the Army at seven months. I'm seven months old. We go back to California anyway. But my dad is from Bastrop, Louisiana, 20 miles outside of Monroe. My mother is from Columbia, Mississippi, mm -hmm. right? Those are really, the South is the hotbed of quartet music, man. But my parents came to Oakland, but the, the tradition came with them. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother, who all she would listen to was the Soulsters, um, uh, the Dixie Hummingbirds, man. So Howard Carroll yeah. was probably my first influence outside of my father um and and it blew me away because my dad couldn't play nothing like that once once again my my dad would do a lick and and just talk crap you know what i mean and get through <laughs> it but howard carroll carried the whole thing with a drum box with a beat box they didn't even call them drum machines back then you know yeah. so um but man Raphael, bro it's four years older than me. Me and Raphael were playing the bass at the same time. He was in a gospel group called the Gospel Messengers. Same thing. The bass was bigger than him. Mm -hmm. He's the first person to have a Kramer that we <laughs> that we saw in, in the Bay Area that had a Kramer, right? Right. And it would be this little competition between all these little gospel groups, man, that were weekend warriors because everybody, all our parents had jobs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we... Um, you know, guys like Raphael and me dreaming about doing it for for a lifestyle instead of just on the weekends. But if it wasn't for them putting us in that place together, man, you know, there was a bunch of us. Elijah, Dwayne wasn't really in the quartet thing, but definitely Carl Wheeler, like the whole Tony, Tony, Tony. Yeah. We all, all our parents are from Louisiana, Mississippi, mm -hmm. migrated to Oakland and um, became that melting pot of the music that they brought with them from the South. Yeah. Man, it's it's amazing how much of that music is up there in Oakland. I, I'm curious about, you know, you're talking about Howard Carroll and Soulsters and things like that. How much do you think the earliest quartet stuff when it's just guitar, you know what I mean, and, and vocals contributed? I mean, like when I hear you play rhythm guitar now with the band, the band could disappear. You know what I mean? And I could just be listening to you. It, and I, I mean, your time is from that. It, it it relates all the way back to, to me, those guys doing that quartet stuff unaccompanied. I hear that in your rhythm guitar playing. 
I, I I wonder why guys don't talk more about like those those earlier recordings when it's just guitar. It's so much the pocket of that music. Well, well, for me, my my dad, um, he wasn't Joe Jackson. He was not Joe Jackson. Let me just say that. But my father was not sensitive when it came to what what the music needed. Okay. Um, and we didn't have keyboard players. My dad didn't want an organ player. My dad didn't want any of that. He wanted me to to make it feel, to feel that. Because he was a big fan of Howard Carroll. Yeah. And so he was like, Howard Carroll don't need all that. Why you need all that? You know? Um, but I always heard so much, Josh. And 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 I tell people everywhere that I go, man, I, I give I give my secrets away. They're not secrets, but the things that motivated me. And um even though I grew up playing quartet, I always heard a million things, man. I heard, mm-hmm. I heard so much stuff in my head. Um, so where, when I got to when I got to high school, I met um, cutting class on the first day, man. Just, just dumb stuff. But I mm-hmm. I bumped into uh, Charles Hamilton, who was the um, he was the band director for Berkeley High School Jazz Band. Okay. And that was the first time I heard big band music, man. Like these high school kids were playing it. And I was like, wow. I was amazed by the horns, mm-hmm. not the individual solo and stuff, the horn sectional stuff. Sure. You know, so to this day, man, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, I, a lot of my rhythm, I've taken from those horn parts that had to lock in with the, but it's four different horns you know you got trumpet you got uh alto sax you got uh tenor you Mm. you may have a trombone in there and all are doing four things but they're doing them rhythmically together yeah so those type of things is what my ear gravitated to and i just tried to get it from brain to finger to fretboard yeah well man there's such a uh, when i hear you play there's such a lineage i can literally hear steps from you know from howard carroll and you know wayne bennett and guys like that you know and and to you and then of course now everybody doing what you do you know it's like you know and for people who don't know everybody you fucking watch play guitar on instagram is playing jubu's shit that he invented you know jerry's Jarius Mosey said says that they're all my sperms. <laughs> 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 yeah, but maybe maybe I'm a part of the, their village. But these there, there are some amazing people out there oh, because yeah. because the the beauty of it today, man. I didn't have YouTube, bro. Oh no, no, no way. I couldn't, I couldn't, have look, any I of couldn't that. visually look and keep rewinding back that lick you did, and just keep rewinding back. I would have to piece it together. I, you know, put my head to a speaker, visualize it, and try to piece it together. Now you can literally see it, man. Yeah, well, but it's the reason that you have such a style that is yours. It's because you had no choice but to come up with a style that is yours. You couldn't just get every little piece of everything you wanted from everybody. It was always an approximation because you had no idea of knowing exactly what they were doing. You know That's I mean? right. That's yeah. right. A hundred percent, man. Okay, so... You start playing, you know, all these weekend gigs and stuff with your dad. And, you know, you make friends with Raphael. You got all these these bands playing quartet and stuff. Um, when was the first, like, paid gig for you? <laughs> okay. the 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 Well, I'm not going to count my dad's gigs as right. being paid because they were church and they would do an offering. And, you know, uh, my dad would usually... Um, he would get a 60 40 split, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, one time, I'll give you a quick story, man. We, we, and, and my dad, like I said, he worked a nine to five for 35 years and retired from that. But every summer, he got three weeks straight vacation. So, he would plan our little tour and everything for the whole three weeks. And we lived for that. Me and my brother, Eric. Pick Punk and my cousin Pop. We lived for this man. Yeah. And so this one particular night, we're driving from Oakland, California to Lake Providence, Louisiana. 
two days of driving, right? Oh, man, yeah. We get there, man. It's about seven people at this church, right? So I, I don't know who, who uh, promoted it, but <laughs> it wasn't done well. Seven people at this church. So my dad goes, after we perform, and my father, if it was one person in there, my dad is going to perform all the songs. He's going to give it because he feel that person he can save. He, he wants to save that person. Okay. So we would we would give it our all, oh, man. I'm, and I'm playing a Gibson Les Paul. You know how heavy they are, right? So yeah. my shoulder after hour two, man, I'm just literally dying. So my dad goes, well, well, y'all, they raised $12. And with the 60-40 split, we got seven and they took five. We're going to go get us Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Unbelievable. But we didn't, we didn't, we didn't care. We just no. we been on that road. We loved performing with my, with my dad and, you know, we lived for it. So, but yeah, what was it? I, I, I don't want to lose where, where no, we No, I'm just curious. Oh, my, first, my first pay gig, I was um, um, 15 years old. Pardon me. I was 15 years old. They put me in this club called uh, Yoshi's. Okay, yeah, sure. Yoshi's is in Oakland, but they had another Yoshi's, which was smaller. Mm -hmm. They put me in Yoshi's every Monday night with my Berkeley High School band under, under parental supervision, mm -hmm. and I made 50 bucks. <sighs> my first gig plan, plan from 9 to 11.30. Yeah. That was my first gig. And I know that feeling. I I'm, I know that that feeling when you start playing a regular gig when you're in high school still, and you make an even if it's fifty bucks every week, and you stuff it in an envelope or whatever, you know, like because that's what the first thing I did was stuff it in an envelope and then go buy another guitar, you know, yeah. once I had done enough weeks, you know. But that's the best feeling ever because it's it really, really it, you already know by that point you're hooked and this is what you're gonna do. But still, that's like when you go like, oh, am I might actually be able to really do this and, and make a living, you know? And it's such a great feeling. It's a great feeling, Josh, but how, how you know, I always tell people like, I'm happily weird. You know, yeah. I'm happy being weird. That's, that's cool. How many people you know that at our age, at our ages, knew what we were gonna do? Like, well, yeah. I, I didn't have a plan B. And my parents used to always preach education, education, man. And I was a horrible student. I couldn't keep my mind on the stuff. I got mm -hmm. my mind on music and rhythms and melody and stuff. I'm tapping on the desk. I'm being sent to the principal's office. Not because I'm disruptive. I just keep tapping on the desk. I'm like, mom, this is not going to be, I'm not going to be a banker. Yeah. I'm not going to the army. I'm gonna play this guitar. If I gotta play it and and put money in a in a box on the streets, this is what I'm gonna do. Yeah, and people, not a lot of people can relate to that, especially when you know so early on, you know, at such a young age that, hey, this is it. Like I, I you know, so I, I mean, I wasn't the worst student in the world, but I knew exactly how much effort I had to put into school to not make my parents mad at me and let me get away with what I needed to get away with to be able to be playing gigs and doing stuff. So whatever amount of effort I needed to put in to get bees was, was all I did. You know what I mean? To keep everyone happy. Cause I knew, man, I'm not going to college. I'm not, I, you know, I just want to go play gigs as much as I can. And I, right, had like, full, I had a full ride to Berkeley college of music. And I knew I wasn't gonna go in there. I didn't. Want, I didn't even want no one. You know why I wasn't gonna go? Listen, why? I was all psyched up, bro, to go. Right? I was all psyched up. I was like, man, I'm gonna be better, even if I'm gonna fight the system, because I don't want people to t tell me how to play. That's my pet peeve. Like, you don't know. You don't know how I got here. So don't don't tell me I have prop improper uh, technique and all this other stuff. It got me here. You know. So I don't want to be put in a box. But at the same time, when they said I had to take English and history, <laughs> oh, no, nah, man, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not going. I, I'm not playing music 24-7. I'm not going yeah. there. Yeah. 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 So you said your dad would always, you know, instill little bits of, hey, you need to be responsible. And, and obviously he was responsible. You said he had a day job. He worked 35 years, you know. What what was his opinion 
on you not going to Berkeley or you not, you know, whatever. You just, he, I mean, because he had to see it in your eyes from day one, pretty much. They, this was it. You're done, you know. Um, Josh, I got to go back, bro. Okay. I got to go back. Um, at 12 years old, I was, I auditioned for a TV show that Carl Wheeler was already on called Just Kidding. Oh. Okay. And I made that audition and I, I was on Just Kidding for about six months at 12 years old. And I, and I, and I got a check for $166 each episode. Mm -hmm. And I did that six, it was like once a week for six months I did it. And then they, um, the guy dropped my father's bass. One of the production people in a big chunk fell out of it. And I went ballistic. And I think the black, the, uh, the, uh, the ghetto came out of me. Um, and I scared those white people <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't, they fixed my dad's bass. It cost them like 1500 to fix my dad's bass. And then they kind of like, let me go. After oh. that, and I'm sure it was because of my my attitude, be, because of the the nonchalant way that the production manager was acting. Right. Oh, we get we'll get some glue and glue that. No, you won't. Yeah, I'm not gonna take a glued base back to my dad. My dad's gonna kill me. You know. Yeah, I'm sure I I didn't say it as nice as that back right. then. So a 12 year old acting like Tupac probably went, went went over the line. But my first paid gig was a TV show. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, your dad had to have seen how serious you were about all this, but yet he's still coming from a place where he worked a job, you know, to, and, and, and not that he maybe didn't want to be a musician full time, but he, he was practical and he had a family and, and all those things. So what were, the, what were your family's opinion of, you know, they, cause they had to know you were lost to this. This was it for you. Well, well, the reason why I brought up the just kidding TV shows because I saved up my money and I helped my dad buy a van. Oh. So the old van, the engine blew out. And I said, hey, dad, um, I got some money saved. So I loaned my dad like $1,200. When I loaned my dad that $1,200 at 12 years old, my dad knew that I was going to be okay. Now, my mother, because she's a natural worry warrior. Mm hmm her thing was do the education and have the music as a, as a backup. So kind of like you, I did just enough so she would give me a car so I could move around how I needed to move around. I, I, I got just enough. I got good grades. You needed to have a B average. All I needed was a C average so I wouldn't embarrass the family. Gotcha. Don't flunk out and stuff like that. So, right. But yeah, they they both were very very supportive, although nervous. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. What about your grandparents? Um, my grandparents were um, the same. Very, my grandfather was a pastor. Mm -hmm. Um, sing his tail off, like, oh my god! And my my aunties. They had a, um, well, they still have a gospel group, quartet group called the Lumsy Sisters. They're in the Gospel Hall of Fame. Um, so my family is, I would always say we're the poor man's version of the Jackson 5 family. <laughs> you know, we yeah. haven't, the greatest voice I ever heard was my auntie's, rest in peace. Wow. Um, if you ever go to a Layla Hathaway show, Layla can split her voice up into two voices yeah. very, very faintly, two-part harmony. My Aunt Shaquita could do three. Jeez. It was scary, man. Like, it was super-duper scary. So the, the, the depths of my musical family, man, my uncles, man, my, my, uh, on, my, on my dad's side, my father, it was really my father that only gravitated to music. The rest of my family on my dad's side is not really into it. But mm. my mom's side, uncles, aunties, grandparents, mm. great-grandparents, they were all ministers. So we were all sing we were all singing in church. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, so when you finish high school and you decide not to go to Berkeley, how do you I mean, 
how do you start, you know, supporting yourself? Like, what's the next step after that? I'm glad you asked that question. I have to credit Raphael Sadiq for this. When I was through a tragedy, his sister, Bar uh, his sister, um, had got killed tragically by the police. Mm -hmm. They were chasing a guy, and she bagged out her car, and the police hit her and and killed her. Um. So when I found out about it, Carl told me about it. He said, hey, man, we're having the quiet hour at this mortuary. So I went to the quiet hour to, just to give Ray my respects. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And um, he said, hey, man, come down to the church. We're going to rehearse because he, he was going to sing at our service the next day. Uh -huh. So I just went down to the church, followed them down to the church. They rehearsed the song they were going to sing. And he was like, hey, man, let me see what you sound like today. So... I grabbed uh, Kenya's guitar and just started playing some stuff. He was like, hey, man, give me, give me a number. So after they buried his sister, a couple of weeks later, he was like, hey, man, you know about my band? I was like, yeah, I, I know about the band. He's like, what do you think about playing with us? I got to get you in the band, man. And I was like, if it's going to get me out of school, I'm with it. You know what I mean? Nice. So Raphael was the conduit to make that happen because he came to my mom's house and he said, if you give him, let him take a year off. That was the compromise I made with my mom. Give me, let me just take a year off. And if nothing materializes, I'm going, I'm going to school, but let me have, I hated school. And my mom knew that. Mm. So just give me a year, mom, and I'll, and I'll go to school. And in that year is when Raphael got me in the group. Wow. So this was already after he was playing with Sheila and stuff like yep. that. Yeah. Wow. So I graduated in 88. They started Tony, Tony, Tony in 88. Right. And I joined, well, I started rehearsing with the band in December of 89. I joined the band in, in 90, of January of 90. And um, I was going to say um, a side note to that, that um, I had... I was working at Sizzler and I had got fired because I got into a fight with this guy. And um, when Raphael came to my mom's house, she was like, you need, you got to get a job. You got to do this and blah, blah, blah. So Raphael was like, what is, um, man, how much is your car note? I was like, it's $200, man. So he wrote me a check for like $600. He's like, get out to your mom. And then from then on, oh, side, another side note. I call the, there was this guy at Berkeley that was calling me all the time. I don't know if he was a counselor or uh -huh. making sure that I, that I was coming, right? Right. So when I told him, I said, hey, man, I just got this gig. Um, I'm a tour with this group for the summer and see how it goes, you know, but, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to probably come or whatever. He's like, so, man, how much is it paying? I said, they're starting me out at 800 a week. He's like, you're not coming here. He said, <laughs> man. This was 89, you know, he said, man, if you're going to come here for four to five years to go, to go home and teach kids and you're not going to make that much, you know, you're not going to make that much in a week. He was like, so good luck to you. And, and, and he knew it and I never looked yeah, back. He knew it. Yeah. He knew it. But I have to credit Raphael, you know, for, for opening that door for me. Wow. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that was exactly how it happened. So that's cool, man. Yep. So, so my big question now is, okay, around that time when you, you know, you end up making the records and playing on those tunes and you play some pretty iconic stuff on those tunes. My question is how soon do you start getting phone calls from other people to play on their shit? Because it was very different what you were playing on R&B music compared to what was going on at the time. It was scary because... I started getting these calls immediately. Right. People I never heard of. And I'm I'm very, I'm very um outgoing, but to myself. Yeah. Um I know so, you're not one to knock down doors and tell people how great you are and you know be go looking for work. I know. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not really comfortable definitely back then. I right. wasn't comfortable, man. I'm I'm a small, I'm a kid from from the Oakland projects. Now people wanting to fly me into Los Angeles, these big, huge studios and stuff. And right. I'm like, man, is somebody going to try to rape me? You know, I, mean? <laughs> I didn't know what the hell. 
You know what I mean? Like, so yeah. I was, I was, yeah, I didn't, but I, I, because people read the credits back then. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even the, the blessing of doing those songs, man, was that nobody gave me direction. And I was, I, I wasn't at a thinking point to think about anything. All I knew was that this is what I play. I'm going to play it on every single thing. <laughs> You know what I mean? I don't know yeah. if it's going to fit, but this is what I play and this is what I hear. And um, and it just worked. It, it just it worked out. man. but I started getting calls immediately, man, for session work. Yeah. You know, at one point, I, I think it was only me and Paul Jackson for a minute. Oh, for sure. I mean, the, you guys were the two most workingest R&B guitar players, I would say. For Paul sure. by a mile, though. Paul's in the Guinness Book, man. Like, yeah. yeah. Man, that's that's amazing to me. So when you started doing those sessions outside of the Tonys and, like, a familiar world of people you knew already, mm-hmm. was, it, was it different? Like, was it eye-opening? Were you nervous at all? Any of that? I would always be nervous until I got into the room. Mm-hmm. And once people started talking to me, they were giving me so many accolades already to where I was like, oh, okay. Then I don't have to do anything but what I've been doing. Right, right. I never I never was put in a situation where I felt I had to outdo myself. Yeah. They were always so nice to me and people were always like man i can't believe we got this guy in the room and you know that was weird and and even the first time i met prince man you know and the stuff prince said to me it just blew me away like yeah okay maybe i maybe this is my gift you know well dude and it's it lets you know how much of a personal style you had because these people were hiring you not just to come in and be the guitar player to play on their records because there's a million good guitar players here in LA that they could call in to come and play. They were hiring you to come be you. And that man, that must have been so cool at a especially at that young age that you were. Man, it, it was it was cool, it was amazing. And a thing that Paul Jackson told me before was that I had I, I had my own style and I wasn't influenced by anyone once again being a radio flipper and not a youtuber Uh i always just i never had my radio station on one thing that's why man i love the eagles bro yeah i love i love toto bro hey bro steve lukather oh my god dude like man if it's good mute hey man uh boston yeah dude like bro i love Oh, Steely Dan, come on, bro. Like, yeah. uh-huh. I would just surf, and when I hear something that caught me, I would try to retain something from it, whether it was a horn sectional part, whether, you know, whatever it was, I try to take it and just add it to me. Yeah. Because we're the sum of our village, man. Absolutely. 100%. 100%, man. It's all those things that we grow up and listen to, and and you continue just adding it into your world. And but I but I'm, that's the difference between you and the greats and, and the regular guys who do it is that you're able to take some of that thing, but always still make it sound like you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when okay, so then I mean we don't need to go down the whole list of everybody play with because it's a lot. But when do you move to LA full time? I moved to LA in. 98 98 okay. my last son was born and um my girl was just like you know you're out here every week you know i'm driving my old mustang back and forth man and right she's like you're out here every week you might as well just move here but i had i didn't want to leave my brother mm. i didn't want to leave my mom my dad like i'm, I'm fiercely like family you know yeah. And, and my brother is my only sibling with my mom. We have I have two half sisters for my mm-hmm. dad, but my my brother. We literally grew up together. Where like, if there's one can of soda, man, my mom would carefully measure and put <laughs> so we have equal. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just like my that separation from him 
was 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 the tough part. But my wife was right. She was like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You're down here all the time. Like, so we moved down there to LA, but I think I could have got the same thing done being up north because when when I got to LA, I didn't want to be the session cat. Yeah. I wanted to I wanted to produce and I wanted to write. I didn't want to be the session guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I found that out, you know, a couple of times, like, wait a minute, man. I'm, I'm getting calls for these sessions and there's nothing but a drum loop. Mm-hmm. This isn't a session I'm writing. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, sure. yeah. And that's a huge difference, bro. Like, it's a huge difference. The sessions pay one time. Yep. Writing pace forever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to get branded like that. I didn't want to be like Paul Jackson. Although once I found out that he gets those checks like twice a year from special payments fund. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I didn't listen, man. I didn't know that. Okay. I didn't know that part. But at first I was just like, no, man, I'm just getting screwed over here. Like, you know, so I didn't want to be that guy. I really wanted to to be on a couple of strong teams. My goal was to work with between Keith Crouch, Warren Campbell, and Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. That was my goal because, I mean, especially Dre, man. I mean, Dre was, man. Well, 98, I mean, been the biggest Bro, 2,000 a day, bro. Like, the day rate is 2,000 a day, bro. He wants to work 30 days out of the month, bro. Like, do the math. Yeah. Man, no high school. I mean, I graduated on the last day of high school. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> like, they had to change a grade to let me walk. But, <laughs> but, yeah, man. You know, so that's what I wanted to really do. But then once I started getting into that world, I don't like the political game. Yeah. I don't like feeling like I got to kiss somebody's ass if you don't have to kiss mine. Yeah. You know what I mean? And maybe I'm too sensitive. I'm a Capricorn. I'm 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 getting better as I'm getting older. But um and then also Josh, deep down inside, I just want to tour the world playing the blues, man. I I know that feeling. <laughs> That's all I really want to do, man. And 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 when somebody calls for, for some production or some writing, if it's something that I that 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 has the integrity that I believe in and, and, and it's a cool um situation camaraderie wise I'm I'm with that as well but honestly man I want to be that guy touring 300 times a year until I'm about 80 bro that hey you and me both man on on that end uh when did you how did you actually meet you know the maze guys and Frankie Beverly like how did that come about you're gonna like this story all right so I'm gonna rewind really quickly Raphael leaves Tony, Tony, Tony. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't want to be here if he's not here. Right. I'm used to being a part of things that are going to be the best. I just didn't think with Dwayne running it, I just thought Raphael was the prince of, of that situation. Like, much, much respect to Raphael, man, for real. Sure. And um, so when he left, I was like, God, I, I don't want to be here, you know, and literally, man, a couple weeks later, I get a call from Ricky Minor. Hey, man, I want you to come down and um, audition for Whitney. He said, um, how are your eyes? I said, what do you mean? You know, I said, I'm, I think they're 2020. You know what I'm saying? He's like, no, man, do you read music? I said, no, I don't read music. I said, a few, I can, a few chord changes, I can see them, you know, but the lines and all that stuff. No. I said, I'm not going to lie to you. I said, I, I said, I've been able to look at charts of songs that I know and fake it, but I'm not going to start that. He said, okay, go buy all her music and then on your drive up here, listen to it. Because he said, your ears must be amazing. I said, okay, I'll do my best. Go down there, get the Whitney gig, right? Right. So I'm touring with Whitney, 99, 2000. Whitney's the one that tells me um, every night that we performed, she had a camera crew. Mm-hmm. We're in Paris, France, 
And after the show, we're in, we're in her suite, me and a couple of, dan- of her dancers. And she leans over to me and she goes, you could do this, right? So I'm, I'm like, I could do what? You know, she said, you can do what, what I'm doing. So what are you talking about? So my eye starts twitching, right? So I'm like, if this woman is telling me that I can move crowds of 50,000 people like she's doing, I'm getting ready to cry. Cause it's, it's a dream of mine, mm-hmm. but you know, after so long, you figure like maybe that's, that isn't for you or whatever. Sure. And she's like, no, you should put a band together, write some songs. Don't leave me, but you know, you should do that. You know, you could do this. Right. So anyway, I'm touring with her on the My Love Is Your Love Tour. In 2000, I get a call and I'm like, hello? Hey, what's going on, brother? Hey, what's going on? Who is this? Yeah, it's Frankie B. Frankie B? Yeah, man, I'm just uh, Frankie B. Frankie Beverly from Maze, right? Okay, man, all right. <laughs> so I hung, up, I hung up the phone, right? I hang up the phone and he dials me back. Hold on, brother, don't hang up. I got your number from Carl Wheeler. I said, hold on, man. Is this really Frank, like the Frankie Beverly? He's like, yeah, brother, it's Frankie Beverly. I said, man, I apologize, bro. I'm I'm not used to the, the actual artist calling. I'm used to management or yeah. an assistant. You know what I mean? And I said, and you sound like a, a radio, a radio disc jockey. I didn't know if he was, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So we we laughed about that, but no, Frankie Beverly called me directly. He said, wow. "Man, I've been I've been checking you out. I've been listening to you on these different albums and stuff, man." He said, "I love your style. I wanted to know if you had eyes for the band. Like, what the hell is eyes for the band? You know?" So he um, took my information, and everything, flew me down the next day himself, and that was really that really reeled me in how hands on he was. Mm. with his with his mute as far as his music you know yeah. um that that left an impression on me so plus i actually man i loved i loved his music oh yeah you know i i mean i freaking love it's it's my my dream gigs would be sting um Sade, frankie beverly if Bob was here, of course, Bob. Yeah. If Sam was here, of course, Sam. Yeah. Um, Cook. And if, if uh, uh, Curtis was here, I would have loved to yeah. play those gigs. You know, not Michael because it was too big. I don't like stuff that, that's too big because you mm-hmm. lose the intimacy sure. and everything is so big. So I still like heart connection stuff, but. Michael's well, Whitney, man, on. Whitney was pretty big at that time, and I'm always wondering. I mean, I've done some of the gigs that big on occasion, and it's like, you know, we're we're improvisers, you and I, and it's weird yeah. when you get into that tour of that size, you're kind of on autopilot most of the nights, you know. Yeah, but here's the thing, though, Josh. Ricky told me he wanted me to be me. Yeah, you That's know, he didn't want, he and he, and he was very. Just say, hey, hey, man, don't don't overplay. Listen to those records and then bring you to those records. So I was blessed because Michael Thompson played on a lot of that Whitney stuff and a lot of uh, the stuff that was produced by Babyface. Mm-hmm. And, man, I did not know this guy, but I loved him. Mm-hmm. Like, just his approach, his tastiness. So that was my blessing to get the Whitney gig was to int- totally introduce myself to Michael Thompson. And it changed my approach for that gig. Yeah. So just imagine Michael Thompson with a whammy bar. Yeah. That's <laughs> with a subtle whammy bar, you know? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, man. Well, I mean, in the maze gig, I can't imagine, you know, obviously it's a fun gig musically, but just the, the ability guitar to wise. guitar but, wise. I've never met a keyboard player that likes likes the gig <laughs> it's fun for it's you a it's fun, fun guitar gig yeah. yeah 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 but i mean even on top of that the just the fact that you've been able to kind of have that gig you know for some stability which as we all know is difficult in this world of ours you know has to have been a, a blessing to you know to just kind of have that there it's it's a thousand percent a blessing and I, and I tell people this all the time 
Um, I'm, I would have liked the business to, to have been better. I would have liked more money. I would have liked raises sometimes. Sure. Stuff like that. But it, it, it got three kids through college and I don't even have a college degree. Yeah. I'm proud of that. You know, I, I really, really am. And I'm, and I'm grateful for his consistency. Mm-hmm. You know, I was grateful for that. Now, the double-edged sword of, of, for that is if you are an aspiring artist, it will slow you down, man, because you get yeah. complacent, you count the money, yeah. and, and you know, it definitely slows me. Like, like I, I tell this all the time to myself, there's no reason why I shouldn't have 10 albums, man, under my name. You're, I agree with you, yes. It's ridiculous that I don't have, you know, now don't get me wrong. I'm aware of it now. I'm in the lab. Yeah. It's not how we start, it's how we finish. But but it can be a double edged sword. It can, man, and it's partially, I mean, I've personally had to make hard decisions of nope, I'm not going on the road with that person. No, I'm not gonna go do those records or shows or whatever. Because, you know, it may not be the best financially. But it's the best here, and it's just the best decision for me personally to focus more on the things that are more rewarding to me and that make me happier. Not that playing guitar for anybody and getting paid doesn't make me happy, but there's still a difference, you know, and you have to choose. Yeah. And it would be it would be great if we if there was more of of an allegiance. You know, I I I would play for Frankie for fifty years if I could open up some of those shows. You know yeah, what I mean? Sure, sure, if, yeah. if, if those type of things were, were you know, because I've always been very communal. You know, I just want to be on great teams, man. So, yeah. you know, um, I wish he was more Eminem for like, and I was 50 Cent. Let's just put it that way. I hear you. I hear you. Well, before we jump into the 10 questions, let's talk a little bit about Legally Blind and what's going on. You know, anything going on with Legally Blind? And for people who don't know, Legally Blind is the band that you have, that you're the leader of, but with your brother and Errol and other friends of ours, Chris Johnson and BJ Kemp and different guys. And uh, you're singing lead on on a lot of this stuff and writing the tunes. People pick up these records if you don't have them. But what do you got going on with that right now? We're in... um, We're in the... We're getting ready to start creating music for the blind. Okay. Um, probably in September, me and Eric are gonna drive to LA and get with Chris and Errol. And what, we, what we're gonna do this time, because all the records that we've ever done, I wrote them, mm-hmm. came up with the concept, send the stuff out to the guys, we come together, we work on it. That's not a band to me. Sure. You know, yeah. it's, it's not a band to me. And, I, and I've always pressed this to the guys. That's why we only have two rec. We have two legally blind albums, but I said from here on out, these albums will be band albums. All these musicians are monsters, bro. Are oh, yeah. monsters. Oh, yeah. I've heard Arrow, I've heard some compositions that Arrow has written. I'm like, dude, that's a legally blind song. You should lead that song. You should sing that song. You know what I mean? Like, I want a total band. So I boycott it and I said, bro. We're, we're going to do this record together. I don't care if, if this one, we set the metronome to, to 98 and it starts off with Eric's bass line. And let's see where it goes. You okay. know, and then once we get the collection of music, then I will go and sit down with like the Harold Lilies and the songwriters that I'm comfortable with and, and tell them what we, what we want to say conceptually. But this will be um, a total band team effort. But we're looking to, to have an album out uh, top of the year. All right. All right. Well, man, after you do that, you got to come out here to my studio and just make the Jubu Blues album, man, and let me help you with that. Yes. Yes, man. Yes, man. Because that album needs to exist as well. That album, the Jew Blues. <laughs> hey, man, you got a Jew right here. We got the Jew Blues going on. Hey, no, someone asked me that in Portland. They said, <laughs> are, you a, are you a Judas... Buddhist. I said, I'll be that if you like the music, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love everybody. Everybody. 
I, nice. I love all people, man. Absolutely, man. No, that that record needs to exist as well. So I, I'm willing. I definitely, if you need any help, I'm there. You know. I need, I need, I need you to just produce it, man. Well, Let's come on. Come with, with this is song. what I got this studio for, man. And yeah, what I'm doing man. all the time now. So come on. <laughs> All right, let's, it, uh, let's jump into 10 questions here. Okay. Number one, when you first started learning and playing, do you remember the first riff or lick or little thing that when you figured it out and got it under your fingers, you couldn't believe you had figured it out? And we know that's like, that's it. It sets the hook. You're, you're, you're stuck forever. Yes. Um, I'll show you. Let me grab my guitar. Yeah. Okay, first thing I learned was actually, because I started on bass, so when I learned this, I felt that I was on my way. <laughs> That's the first thing, yeah. Yeah. And then on guitar, there was... um. The song called Hold to His Hand by the by the Bronner Brothers, right? Okay. Now that guy's name was Fred Bronner. He was my first whammy bar influence. Ah, uh -huh, okay. So this song went, it goes. that i was like i'm a bad man bro <laughs> that feeling of you know when you when you learn something you've listened to a million times as a kid for the first time and you get it right it's, it is there's no turning back after that moment it's like you learned a magic trick man and 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 a lot of a lot of that to me too the a lot of awakenings the guitar i was able to get through wes yeah. Um, when I learned this. When I started learning that stuff, oh my God, bro. Wes, Wes just, oh man. Yeah. yeah. What well, on that thing. note then, on that note, maybe number two, uh, maybe this is the answer to number two, but do you remember the first solo that ever moved you so much you had to learn it note for note? It would probably be Spanky. Okay. And it wasn't it wasn't a record. It was a live show that my dad had recorded. He came out here with the clouds. Mm -hmm. And um nope, 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 nope. It's his solo on gospel. You ever heard gospel the, the movie gospel? Mm-hmm. When they are, they're singing I came to Jesus, right? <laughs> Where he goes. Yeah. 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 Bro. Bro. When I yeah, it was Spanky. That was the okay, for people who don't know, he's talking about Spanky Alfred. You need to check out if you don't know, you were missed. I mean, come on, you better know by now, but yeah. Man, please know Spanky Alfred. And 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 if I can tell you another couple of names. Uh, Sugar High Tower, um, um, from the Slim and the Supreme Angels, man. Yeah. Um, well, we'll come on, man. I'll, I'll we're gonna do it. Man, a couple of these. speaking of that, did, have you watched um the Summer Soul movie yet? Yes. Dude, did you see Wayne Bennett with with that with Mahalia and and Mavis playing back there and starting that tune? I literally I saw it in the theater and I stood up and shouted. That's Wayne Bennett, because there's not much footage of him. You know no, what I mean? And he's, I mean, I'm such a huge fan from the Bobby Bland stuff that he plays. On, and it's like, I couldn't believe I was, yeah. But they, they play that, you know, uh, Mavis is singing and they get to that diminished chord. And he let off a, and I was like, yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, man. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number three. What's the first thing you play every time you pick up a guitar? Do your hands just go somewhere on autopilot? Um, probably this lick. <laughs> is it why is that first? Just is it like warming you up? I don't know why it's that. Woo! Is it just because you're it's warming you up? Maybe so. I just, I just feel like my hands, you know, I can. There's something that'll help me glide. Or if what I'm about? Recording, it's, it's probably you. Okay. When I'm being cordial, but but usually it's that lick. I don't know why. Woo! What about what about when you get to the gig? And it's some backline, and you got to check the amp to make sure it's good. What do you do to, you know, it tells you if you're in for a good night or a bad night within 30 seconds. You know? Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> I'm sorry. To, I'm, I, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings, but it's. That's fun. Nice. So I'll, I'll just keep going. Yeah, but it's Star Spangled. Nice. That's a good way to test it out. Test an amp out. <laughs> All right, number four. What key, style, song, groove, whatever, do you hear the most when you're not playing? Like when you're cooking eggs or taking a walk? Like for me, I guess, man, if I we were doing nothing right now, I'd be hearing a shuffle. Ba -ding, ba -ding, and I'd be hearing... Ba -da 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 -da. It never goes away. What never goes away for you? <laughs> um a shuffle yeah. but what i always hear and what i always see is albert collins shaking his jerry curl <laughs> and doing this lick oh. i saw him do that at the monterey jazz festival right he had a 300 foot cord that they take the and he was on the top of his bodyguard Shoulders <laughs> going through the whole audience, just like, do, 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 do. and I was like, Jesus Christ, man! Like, Oof. it was so, it was, it was orgasmic, man. Oh wow. man, I, I mean, nothing. If you never saw Albert Collins live, nothing prepared me for that when I was a kid, like because it just it literally punches you in the gut, just like what? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see him live, but it comes. It, it he pops off screen, bro. Like, yep. Like Jesus, man. Unbelievable. Does your dad like Albert Collins or any stuff like that? Do you listen to any stuff like that? My dad wouldn't turn from it, but his um, he liked more like um, once again because oh, well, I have the guitar in my hand. My father said he'll do something like this. It. it if we're going from the one to the four, right? Mm -hmm. My dad can play that and he'll go. Uh. See, I never went to music school. You know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> so they'll say, play baby. That's all right, ain't it? So he wasn't, but my dad loved Clarence Carter. Woo! You know, that yeah, stroking. Stuff, He'd be stroking. Yeah. <laughs> my, my dad's favorite song when before he left here was uh uh oh my god. Oh, back that thing up. Oh god, yes. <laughs> back that so my dad was more into funny, catchy stuff where I was always the serious one. Mm. You know. Funny. Yeah. That's man, that's awesome. Uh oh, Clarence Carter. I saw Clarence Carter probably when I was 10 years old wow. and he had girls dressed as nurses on stage with him. Like, cause he was Dr. CC, you know what I mean? And he, it was, I just remember, what is that? What am I watching here? You know, as a 10 year old. Yeah. I saw him with Bobby Rush in, in 19, just before the pandemic. Oh, wow. Awesome, man. Crazy. Crazy. All right. Number five. 18. 18. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Number five. When did you feel like you started to find 
your voice on the instrument on the instrument which you really obviously have a very personal voice but when you were you know coming up did you even realize what you you know were there moments of oh this sounds different and i'm going to go further this way or was it just completely natural it was it was thought out it was planned out man Mm -hmm. um I didn't listen to guitar players on purpose when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. The only guitar player that I really listened to was B.B. King. I listened to Albert King. I listened to Albert Collins. I listened to George Benson. And I listened to Wes Montgomery. Mm -hmm. Those, what those guys had in common to me, distinction. Oh, 100%. If you ever heard a record, you knew that was B.B. King. If you hear Benson record, you know that's Benson. You hear Wes and, and Albert King, Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know it's an Albert King record. It, it may be the same link. Mm -hmm. The same link for each song. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. but you know it's... A, so at, even as a young kid, Josh, I understood the value, the value of distinction. I didn't want to sound like everybody else. That's why I did. I gravitated to listen to the horns, Clark Terry. Miles Davis is probably my favorite musician, bro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rest that's, in peace. Well, that's, I mean, that's pretty, you know, you had pretty good hindsight to, to know that it was going to be important and to want to find your thing early on. It took me a bit to, like, realize how important that was, you know? And, I mean, I was a kid, but... You know, I just wanted to sound like my heroes at first, you know what I mean? And learn as much as I could. And then, yeah, eventually it's like you see somebody else doing that same dog and pony mimic show. And you realize, wait, is that what I sound like? I'm just copying everybody like that guy? Oh, that's no good. You know? Well, it's like going to, when we used to go to Cozy's on Monday nights. And how many people were literally dressed like Stevie Ray and... and, and um. I did when I was a kid. <laughs> Man, like literally, they were dressed like Stevie Ray and and um, and and Jesus Christ. Yep, I know, I know, I know. Um, yeah. And Crazy. Jimmy, you know what I mean? Like they would literally dress like this guy to beat their guitars up and everything. And it's like, okay, but we already have them. Yep. 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 You're right, man. 100%. Well, you succeeded in finding your own voice. That's for damn sure. Thank you, sir. All right. Number six. This is, I'm curious about this one. What do you consider your biggest weakness on the guitar? Oh, I can't do harmonics. <laughs> what do you mean you can't do harmonics? Like, I don't know. Like, if I do the chord, like, I'll, I'll see Sharky do a chord, right? Like, he, he'll do a chord. Mm -hmm. And he knows where to go to do the harmonic oh. part. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but I don't know how to do it. Interesting. Interesting. Man. I don't know. I'm not so great at them either, Ad, now that you say that. <laughs> I'm horrible, bro. I wouldn't even know where to start. And I, I asked Sharky to show me one time. He's like, man, you're great. You don't need all that. Man, show me the shit, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Let me play around with it. I can write a song using that stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. All right, number seven. Who's a huge influence on your guitar playing that people would be surprised to hear? Jeff Lee Johnson. Oh, you're the second guy to say that to me. I'm shocked. But please tell why. Because he's so bad. But tell tell people why. Um... Great things that I like about people, if I'm able to get it, that's amazing to me. Like, I can tell his life was full of tragedy from the way he plays. I can tell he's a dark person from the way he plays, right? But even in that, he was so gifted that nothing comes out but beauty. Even the darkness is beautiful, man. And I just, the first time I ever heard him was, was on a cassette tape. And it was really grainy and messed up, bro. And, and, and I just broke down crying. Like, this dude, he just did it for me. 
Like, he really, really did it for me. And I remember the first time meeting him, and we were talking, and, and he basically told me, like, yeah, man, I, I lost my wife tragically, and I really don't care to be here. I got a couple of nieces that really want me to stick around. But he was just, just you know, it's such a a, a, a tragic, tragic place that he was in personally you can't deny his genius on that wood man like and oh, hell no the most the most incredible solos on two <laughs> like would you please turn the shit up jeff lee <laughs> but he has his back to you yeah it's like i don't want to be here man i'm just well that was always weird to me the back to you thing you know like yeah yeah but yeah jeff jeff lee is Jeff Lee is probably my favorite guitar player, to be honest with you. So yesterday, literally yesterday, I interviewed Big D from John Cleary's band, Derwin Perkins. Okay. okay. And he, he's a huge fan of yours. But he answered that question the same as you, Jeff Lee. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, Jeff Lee is a is a is a hidden gem, man. And you know, for me, even more so than Spanky, because you can go back, you can go to their origins. You can tell like Spanky gravitated to jazz. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, we Spanky has the quartet background, gravitated to jazz. I have a quartet background, I gravitated more to blues. Mm -hmm. Um Jeff Lee has the quartet background, but he's gravitated to cosmic. Like, yeah. like, like um like Hendrix, you know? Yeah, yeah. He and and I and yeah, he just he does it for me, man. Like he really did. He did it for me. That's and I was grateful. And even Rochelle Pharrell told me, she's like, you know, he doesn't talk to anybody. And he's and he spoke to you. You guys had a real conversation. I said, I think he knows my heart. Same way I feel about Eric Gales, man. First time I met Eric Gales, I immediately started praying for him because he was so high, bro. Yeah. I was like, God, please don't take this man's life. He has too much to give us. Mm -hmm. Please don't, you know. Um, when I found out about little little Jimmy, yeah, and I and I tell I tell Ladonna all the time, I've been praying for this man before I even met this man. Same, same here. I mean, I've, you know, been following Eric. He's a few years older than me, and I've been following him since I was a kid. You know what I mean? And loving yeah, him. Man. And then we became friends, and it was like even then was during not the best of times, you know what I mean? And to see him come out the other side now is just, it's so great because you just, you can't help but love this man. He's such a great dude, irregardless of the incredible talent that he has, yeah. which is amazing, of course. Well, man, you just can't help but love extension. him. The instrument is just an extension of, of, of who we are. Yeah. And, and the dude is so phenomenal that you know he's on a higher spiritual realm than most of us yeah whether he ran from it all those years or not you know yep. god god gave this man an emote an emoting um he he just has a special special gift and once again like i was telling you earlier he was one of the people that and he humbled me he really humbled me Oh yeah, and he can do that to you. <laughs> I was just like, "Oh my god!" And he can't even stand up. They're walking him. They're carrying him out of here because he can't stand up. His eyes were so glossy. Yeah. And instead of me jumping into hate mode, I immediately start praying for this guy. Please, God, keep this guy here for me. Please, God, keep this guy here for this world. He has something to say, yeah. you know. So yeah. Yeah, that's 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 what Jeff Lee did for me. Man, I'm excited for you to hear uh, the record that uh, Joe and I produced. The Eric's new record It's really good. I'm excited for everybody to hear it. I want you to introduce me to Joe. I've never okay. met Joe. I've I've played at uh, Sugar Hill Sugar Sugar Mill. Yeah, a couple of times, and I always get there late. And Zach is always like, "You just miss Joe, man." Oh man! I tried to hold Joe. I tried to hold me. Listen, when I tell you, man, he knows who you are. We've talked about you, bro. What a monster, bro! 
Like what a mo- what a slick cat. Like I just wish I could wear some of the wardrobe, bro. Like the dude. <laughs> the we got to get a hang cold, together, bro. man. We got to get a hang together. Man, I would love that, man. And a- I don't care if we don't we don't have to play. We can eat sushi, man. I don't Joe's care. Joe's a great dude, man. That's my brother. He's a he's a great people, you know. Well, well, you know, you produce me, and if you want to bring him in, you have my permission, okay? <laughs> all right, all right. All right. All right, number eight. Would you rather have on a gig a great guitar and a shitty amp or vice versa? A great amp and a bad guitar. Uh, give me the good guitar. Okay. Because, because I guess between me and the sound guy and the people out there, I mean, we can figure that part out. But I have a problem. I, I can't hide my emotions. So if the guitar is shitty, man, it's going to ruin my night. <laughs> it's going to ruin my night. You know. So for me, yeah. And my brother will, will, will answer that for me, too, because he's, he said, my... Oh, you asked me, too, what's my Achilles heel mm-hmm. earlier, right? And I said mm-hmm. harmonics. Okay. Tone. My lack of searching for a great sound for me. Um, hey man, give me uh, my my amp is an Ampeg Rocket Reverb. Right. So give me an amp with a dirty and a clean channel, and I'll dial that in and and, and use my hands. My, my brother's like, yeah, but dude, you could be doing stadiums if you get a, if you get some sound going. I was like, okay, well, we'll get to that point. So th- I want to use Dave Delone because his he's a monster, bro. Like. He's not even a real, he's not a guitar player, he's a keyboard player, but like, how how do you get your rig like that? You know what I mean? Dave's, Dave's a talented cat, man. Dave's super talented. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, see, I'm the opposite. I, I, I'd take the better amp than the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because you can play your way, you can play your way through it. I get that, I get that, but like I said, I would just be like, and that's that's another thing too, man. I don't have endorsements because I I I get attached to what I'm playing. Yeah. You know, um, you said earlier like you you saved your money on the gig so you could get another another guitar. My brother has probably thirty bases, bro. I I got the same guitars that I've had mm-hmm. from the gate. The only thing I lost was my Strat that got stolen. Right. So, so I'm. I'm kind of loyal to a fault so if i find a good guitar i'm running nice yeah i mean i'm i'm with you i mean yes it's great to have i i got a lot of guitars a lot of them i got over the years when i was doing more sessions and i needed to have things that sounded a certain way yes i mean yeah, i played that telly for 15 years on everything basically until now that i'm playing this new version of it basically but yeah i i prefer to have one like kirk Kirk play new guitar every week. You know what I mean? It don't make yeah, a difference. Kirk can. <laughs> yeah. And hey, shout out to Kirk. He's a shout monster. Shout out to Kirk. <laughs> now, did he move overseas? Yeah, he's in Switzerland. Wow. He yep. met a nice Swiss woman, didn't he? Yes, he's in love. Yep. Yeah, that'll keep you overseas. Absolutely. All right, man. Number nine. What keeps you motivated and growing as a guitar player? What keeps you putting in the time to learn new stuff, man, when you could rest on your laurels because you're, you're Jubu, you're a legend. You got your own sound and you, do, you know, what keeps you working on new things? Um, I don't want my gifts taken away and I'm very spiritual. So I believe that God wants you to till the soil in all aspects of your life. Yes. So every day I try to, engage her in some way at some point um my favorite guitar to play actually is my diaquisto um hollow body so i can pick that up and just doodle doodle on that but yeah i i I think that that i don't ever i don't want to lose my gift and i'm 51 today i want to be one of the greatest greatest 51 year olds you've ever heard so when i get 80 hopefully i want to be one of the greatest 80 year olds you've ever heard. So only way I'm gonna do that is to keep working at it. That's the right at man. That's, I love that. Cause I feel the, the same way. Like I just, I don't take for granted any minute I get, cause it's, it's my favorite thing in the whole world is to play yeah, this too, guitar. 
So it's like, uh, I owe it to th this instrument has literally brought me everything good that exists in my life. Everything. So it's like, yeah. man, I owe everything to this guitar. I'm willing to, I, I just want to keep getting better at it. And then even go deeper. The, that guitar has shaped your mindset on certain things. Not only did it bring you your lady that brought you your children and all that stuff, yeah, but yeah. It, it shaped your mindset. When you hear something so good coming from your fingers, it, it develops a love, a natural love that you're going to have for your fellow man because you're so grateful for this gift that you have, man. You know, yeah. everybody can't do this, bro. And everybody don't sound like you sound, like, honestly, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, so yes. when you realize that it's truly a gift. I, I had a man when I was, I was 16 years old. I did a show in Seattle with, with uh, my cousin's gospel group called the Legged Brothers from San Jose. And a man comes up to me after we played. He said, how old are you, young man? I said, 16, sir. He said, I've been playing the guitar for two years longer than you've been born. I'll never come close to you. He was reserved to that. I'll never come close to you. So when I think of, of, of stuff like that and realizing like, you know, to have people like you wanting to know how I got here and stuff like that, man, this is a gift that the person in the audience, that could be me in the audience wishing I could play like me. Yeah, yeah. But it happens to be me. So yeah. the only way I feel righteous, I mean, rightfully so to give back to God is with my time and my effort to show him that I appreciate the one thing that I think I'm decent at in my life. <laughs> I can't change oil, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for this, man. Grateful yeah. for this. You're Jewish. I'm African-American or whatever they're going to label me, right? What other way would we we have been would, would have been able to connect? Well, I mean, I don't know, you know, unless we went to school together or something. Who knows, you know? Who knows? But, yeah. but this sewed it up pretty strongly, man. Oh yeah, I mean, because you so can't universal. deny what you're hearing. Yeah. And yeah. then when you hear somebody like you, you know that you're in love with the instrument. You know that you've given it your heart and your soul. We have now we have something in common. Oh yeah. So yeah. even through a chance meeting, we have things in common. Mm -hmm. My mother used to tell me this would, when I, I had trouble with relationships for so long, and my mother would say, "No woman wants to be second. Whoever your woman is will be second." And that's my truth. Mm -hmm. Now don't get me wrong. I love my wife. We're we're 25 years in, brother. She ain't going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. Yeah. But I'm saying she had to understand like you you're number 2. You know, it's I mean, we have got a lot in common, my friend. <laughs> I mean, my <laughs> wife and I had 20 years, you know, and she she knows the drill, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh yeah, it takes, you know, but that's what it takes to to do what, what, what you, this thing we want to do, you know? That's what it takes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so to finish up the 10 questions then, where do you want to be five years from now? Besides the best 56-year-old guitar player in the world. <laughs> do you, Are you a guy be... who has a whole list of, of goals, you know, that you have to get to? Or is it more, you know, you're open to what happens, you know? Okay. I would love to be on uh be with a great booking agency um that understands me and gets me and realize that i have a bunch of different things in me i have blues in me i have legally blind i have the gospel stuff you know i would love five years from now to be with a great agency that really gets me and, and gets all the things that i bring and i'm literally playing 300 shows a year and I would love to be doing probably 20 to 30 of those shows on a on a bill with you, Joe, Gales, Fletcher, myself. You know, I would I would love that. But five years from now, I just want to be touring, man. I, I just love yeah. the people. I love the travel. I love the camaraderie with the band going from place to place. You know, mm -hmm. um, I love changing people's hearts. You know, yeah. um, I got a hundred dollar tip from a Klansman in Mississippi. 
His father was a grand wizard. And he came up to me and he told me, he said, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I was a Klansman and my father is still a grand wizard. He said, but you're one of the greatest guitar players I ever heard. And I want you to, to take this. And it was, a, it was a hundred dollar tip. That man tipped me better than anybody I've ever had in my life. So, you know what? Clan's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to cut that little clip out of the interview and just re recycle it. Jubu says the clan's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm just saying it's, it just goes to show what 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 comes from the heart can reach the heart if there's a heart, you know. So you can change lives with this instrument, man. You can you can change people's attitude with, with this instrument and, oh, and yes. you know and that's what i want to do just keep touching people and yeah and and, and giving being giving my honesty yeah man well you're an inspiration to me man and to many others uh thank thank you for doing this i'm gonna have links to all things jubu in the description of this video so you can support this man buy his music listen to his music um if you're a ruler we're going to come back and do the turn two in a second if you're not a ruler you should become one or at least subscribe but dude thank you for for having this conversation with me it's really been a pleasure to hear your story and and to, and to get to know you even more than i already did man and like i said you're a true inspiration hey man i, I want to thank you i want to hold you to this producing my record i want to hold you to that but i want to i want to thank you man like i said man when I first met you, I saw great things because I heard great things. And you're a cool person and I love your plan. I love you. I don't know you, like I told Gales, I don't know you yet as much as I am, but I know I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. So I appreciate <laughs> you, man. Well, right back at you, man, right back at you. And hopefully there's much more hanging and playing between us here in the future. Yes, it is. All yes, right, is, all right, rulers, we'll be right back.